what if I'm wrong? What if all my assumptions or the way that I'm seeing the world is just wrong? What then? What's the ripple effect? That's the question every leader should ask, and that's what we're going to address in this episode of The Leadersmith. In a world of incompetent bosses, micromanagers, and petty tyrants, you are listening to The Leadersmith. Now, here is your host, Darren Gertis. Okay, so today's episode comes from a um, article in Forbes magazine published on June 21st, just about a week ago. Uh, the toughest question any leader can ask now, what if I'm wrong? Now, the, the article itself doesn't have any political overtones, although we ought to be using that as a kind of a case study to see, like, how should this work? Because uh, I can't address you in your circumstance, but we all can see what's going on in the world all around us. So the article by Todd Nordstrom is is pretty brilliant. Um, he talks about, he starts off talking about the, the Dewey treat. Uh, Dewey defeats Truman headline in Chicago in 1948. Oops. Or in 1946, the, the slogan, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette, which now is laughable, but at the time, it, it seemed like it was a plausible uh, advertising headline. He says, for me, the day that will live in infamy, it's the day that I realize that I might be wrong, that my opinions, my thoughts, perceptions might be entirely incorrect. And that's, that's good. I mean, you should start thinking about what if you're wrong. You shouldn't be just assuming that you're correct. You should be trying to test reality against your assumptions. You should actually be doing this. If you hold a particular position. So I had an interesting um, uh, interaction with one of my former students listening to my podcast. Someone I deeply respect, but is on a different side of the political spectrum than I am and was really pushing back against where I am and very respectfully. But pushing back against where I am. But I think the assumption was that I'm not testing or trying to disprove my own position. When I go out on the on the Facebook and, and, and other things, I say, okay, here's what I think, for example, I've been reading and reading and reading and, and listening to lectures and things on, on YouTube and whatever, just trying to understand what's going on. Um, and I try to understand, I, I know my own position, that's not the issue. I try to understand the other position. So I'll say, hey, look, if I understand social justice, for example, um, if I am a, in a majority, then I am by default an oppressor, and therefore I can't not be racist. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? I'm. What I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, so systemic racism if that if systemic racism is true is that correct and what i'm doing is trying to make sure i'm understanding the other side as it is rather than understand just my own perception of it because if, if i'm hacking at a straw man that's that's useless but you have to be intentional about that i mean i've spent hours and hours now watching lectures from marxist professors to understand how they're thinking about it now import that into your business place what if it's about a uh, a product or what if it's about a service you're about to launch something i knew the guy that that launched new coke i mean egg on his face in for for his life right i mean new coke seemed like it was a great idea but it was a terrible bomb and they had all the research showing it but they didn't have ground truth about it so um you will new coke is sweeter it's it's sweeter than pepsi so, so it's got to be a hit well yeah, but there was a psychological reaction to that when new Coke hit and we can't have classic Coke anymore. No, don't take away my classic Coke. Okay, at any rate, let me continue. None of us want to be wrong, says the article, but what if we are? What if we make a bad decision, something that negatively impacts our business, our team, our culture, our future for years to come? What if we pick the wrong side? So he's asking very good questions. Okay, continue. In, in business, um, we talk about case studies and best practices, and we love to glorify trends. We really do. I mean, business is, is rife with that. And, and you'll see this bandwagon effect. The zeitgeist will take over. For, and you'll see this. If you're around in the business literature long enough, you'll see different fads come and go. Um, so you got to be careful. Beware of the fad. If you're the decision maker, people expect you to make the decision rather than letting what everyone else is saying make the decision for you. You can't do that. You have to stand your own ground. Now, I would say that that's true regardless of where you are in business, whether you're the decision maker or whether you're somewhere down the line. And But for you, you have to think through things reasonably and rationally and make these decisions. So here are a few simple things to remember before making the call. And so he gives four 
ma major ideas, three of which are really good. One's okay. Okay. One, analyze the intentions behind the information. So that's what I was talking about earlier. He says this, quote, do your homework and conduct plenty of research. However, I do think it's important to consider the intentions of every author of the information you research. Let me go back to my example now. So I was talking about, I'm watching, I'm not, a, I, I just read Foucault. I hate Foucault. I just read uh, The Madness of Civilizations. I'm into a second work right now. I've read um, a number of books about uh, critical race theory now. I've watched um uh, videos uh, about critical theory, about social justice, about whatever. But instead of just watching what the conservatives say about social justice, I'm actually watching Marxist professors, critical theory professors talking from their side about... So and one thing was fascinating. So for example, um, the, the right does not like the Frankfurt School. Okay, that's pretty well established. The Frankfurt School is a bunch of Marxists that came over to the U.S., after, you know, uh, ran away from Hitler, came to the U.S., and then scratched their heads and said, why didn't um, Marxism take? Why did fascism take? And, and they were trying to answer that question because they wanted to see Marxism. And so the right talks about cultural Marxism coming out of the Frankfurt School, and they're correct about that. But what they don't really get into the nuances of is that, and, and I only got this because I was watching uh, a, um, I can't remember what the name of the program was, but it was a symposium by people from the Frankfurt School talking about their own side and how awesome they are in what they're doing. And in that, I realized, oh, well, they were looking at anti-Semitism and, and when they're looking at anti-Semitism, they're thinking this is like almost a seed of intersectionality because as they're looking at anti-Semitism, they're saying, oh, well, if this can happen to the Jews, maybe it could happen to um, some other minority group. And so you can see how it developed. But I only saw that not by looking at, um, you know, what the right was saying as a summary of it, but going to the original source. So I would urge you to go to the original sources, go listen to the arguments of the other side, but understand what they're trying to do. If if you're trying to understand Black Lives Matter, go to the Black Lives Matter page and read what it is. You can read summary interpretations elsewhere, but see what they actually say about their own movement. Okay. Anyway, let me, I'm, I've digressed long enough. So analyze the intentions behind the information. That means try to understand what perspective they're coming from. Okay. Number two, trust your gut, but question it. So he says this, quote, it's important to be critically aware of your own biases and a little bit later, and how might all your personal perceptions be influencing your decisions? That's right. I, I make no bones about it. I come from a conservative Christian perspective. Now, that's a very studied perspective, but I come from that perspective. So what I keep trying to do is test my assumptions against what, what you know, is this correct? And then I'll ask liberal friends, is or progressive friends, because liberals tend to be on my team. It's weird. I mean, when it comes to, <laughs> I mean, I, I get along more with liberals now than I ever have before when we're dealing with uh, issues of social justice and progressive thought, because progressives tend to want to shout down my side of the argument and liberals tend to want to hear me and tell me I'm wrong, which is okay. I'm fine with that. Tell me I'm wrong and show me what's different and we can have a conversation. At any rate, so trust your gut, but question it. Uh, be critical of your own biases. So I, in this scenario, I shouldn't be just reading conservative types of material. I should be listening to the other side. So I would urge you to do the same thing. Number three, resist multiple choice decisions. And here's the quote, uh, making decisions based only on the options that you see means you haven't done enough critical thinking on your own. Okay, yeah, you should. I mean, if it's only if it's either this or this, if you're either a racist or an anti-racist, you haven't done enough critical thinking because there are other alternatives and uh, that locks you into a no win situation. And I will stand on that all day long. That is a malignant form of um, non thinking that we need to not put up with. Now, if you can have a conversation with someone about why is this going on, then you can actually start to make some progress. But if it's just you have to, there, there's a difference between listen to someone, which you should, you should listen to someone and the alternative of shut up and listen where you have no right to speak or engage or question or understand or interact in any way. 
those are two very different things. And I think there's a there's a reasonable group of people saying, listen to me, and you should listen, absolutely. And then there's an unreasonable, the game is locked, you you have no re, no right to speak, or you, sh you should be deplatformed because you have no right to speak. Um, and that is not okay. Okay, number four, it's better for you to be wrong than to allow someone else to be wrong for you. That means you should think on your own. He says this, quote, if you're worried about making a wrong decision, the last thing you want to do is to give ownership to someone else. So don't just uh, go with whatever your crowd says. Um, and I don't know which side of the spectrum you're on because I don't know who you are, but whichever side you're on, don't just go with whatever is popular, the zeitgeist. Don't just do that. If you do that, you're going to have problems because you're not really listening, focused, um, doing what you should be doing. Okay, so. All that being said, I want to shift gears and I want to look at what if you are wrong? What if you're wrong? I mean, think about this. So if you're wrong and you just make a decision about, you know, when you're going to get to work that day, no problem. It's not a big, not a big deal, um, you know, a, a few minutes late. If you're wrong and you're the CEO of the organization, you can bankrupt the place. So the higher you are in the spectrum, the more important it is that you're right and that you follow those examples. Okay, so with that being said, I want to turn my attention to uh, the Washington, uh, I'm sorry, the New York Times today, this morning's New York Times, nearly $1 billion shifted from the police budget that pleases no one, according to the New York Times. And I, I'm using this just as a case study, just to kind of illuminate what we're talking about. Now, those four principles that we talked about were pretty good principles. So the budget, according to the New York Times, so here, quote, New York City uh, officials on Tuesday agreed to a grim coronavirus era budget that will sharply curtail municipal services, impose a hiring freeze, and in a move meant to placate calls to defund the police, shift real, uh, roughly $1 billion from the police department. Now, the overall city budget is $88 billion, but the police department's budget is only $6 billion. So you've cut a sixth of the New York City Police Department budget. Now I'm going to shift gears for a second. I'm going over to another um, another article. Um, this was two weeks ago from the New York Post. Murder is rising, but New York doesn't seem to care. And now I'm quoting. Until now, over the month, this is a quote from the New York Post. Two weeks ago, until now, over the month of June seventh including the crucial Memorial Day weekend, New York murder rate has more than doubled to 42 murders over uh, from 18 the year before, a jolt of uh, a jolt of 133%. Shooting victims including wounded are up 45%, stabbings are up too. So that's from the from the New York Post. So crime is gone way up uh, and we're cutting one billion dollars out of six billion dollars in the operating budget for the New York City police. 32 to 17 vote. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? I mean, what if it's, it's a good idea to do this? Okay, let's say. Maybe it is a good idea to do this, but I, I don't think that's... We want to check our assumptions. Okay, so let me continue. Advocates of overhauling the police department argued that the cuts did not go far enough. Remember, there are places all across the country saying, defund the police. You know, I don't think that that's that defund the police is really what you want. I think this next paragraph is exactly what you should be focused on. And we should be thinking this way. So one of the councilmen said this, quote, black folks want to be safe like everyone else. We just want to be respected, said Councilman uh, I. Danique Miller, co-chairman of the council's Black, Latino, and Asian caucus, who opposed reducing the size of the police department. And I think that's the crux of the issue. I, I don't think, other than anarchists, most people want to actually defund. They just want respect. And there's a legitimate place to talk about having a conversation about whether the outcomes are the same or whether um, there's a reason for the outcomes being the same or whether uh, African Americans are respected less than white Americans or whatever else by the police. Those kind of things are legitimate questions to have or legitimate conversations to have. The reaction of just defund or the reaction of just 
cut the budget is, is silly. In fact, cut the budget. Jocko Wilnick was on a podcast the other day and he was saying, look, you know, the reason that SEALs are so fierce is that they train for months for each operation. So instead of cutting the police, you should be doubling or not doubling time and a half the budget or whatever so that they can be training to do things right instead of three months of the academy and then you're out on the streets. And there's That's a legitimate perspective and we should be having that conversation. Okay, let me continue with the New York Times article. AOC has weighed in on this. She said defunding, quote, defunding the police means defunding the police. It does not mean budget tricks or funny math. So, I mean, she's hardcore, wants to defund the police. She doesn't have to worry about it because she has plenty of protection where she is. Um, the mayor, this is another quote in the article, the mayor and Mr. Johnson are also projecting the police department will be able to reduce its overtime costs by $350 million. But it's not clear on what basis they're using for that projection. Okay, so part of this is, you know, uh, a big block of $400 million somehow moving from the police to the Department of Education for... Um, what, however they're going to secure the schools. I'm not sure how that will work out. Another $350 million for um, uh, reducing overtime. Now, if the city need, uh, size of New York is needs that overtime, they probably still need that overtime, or you need to hire more people so you don't have that overtime, and we're going the other direction. What if you're wrong? What happens to the good citizens of New York City if crime spikes? People will pay a legitimate human cost because of our assumptions. So, and, and that's true wherever you are, whether it's New York City or whether it is um, within a corporation, and whatever your decision, however, the higher you are, the more um, impactful your decisions are. So you should be asking, what if you're wrong? Okay, so I've ranted long enough today. You've got the, the gist of it from the, uh, the, the news article and how you should be approaching this. But think in terms of humility. You don't have the answers. I don't have all the answers. I know I need to understand the other side better than I do. Um, even though I believe that I, I understand some things about my own side, I need to listen I, you know, there, there's that old state statement about how you have two ears and one mouth. Yeah, there's something to that. So we should be listening far more than we do. Okay, so here, this leads us to the quotation for contemplation for today. And it's this, quote, the greatest friend of truth is time. Her greatest enemy is prejudice and her constant companion is humility. Said Charles Caleb Colton. Hey friends, listen, I, you know, I hope that this was helpful. I hope this helps you just take a step back from everything, whether it's uh, what's going on in the world or what's going on in your organization. Just take a step back and think, what if I'm wrong? And that humility is going to go a long way. And that humility will never hurt you. It will only help you. And I hope that this helps you become the kind of leader that you would want to follow. Thanks for your time.